said it worked real good. He works. He sleep with blue light. It's working. House of blue lights. House of blue lights. All right, we're live. Good evening and welcome to tonight's blended meeting of the Southwestern City School District Board of Education. The Ohio Legislature approved emergency legislation to allow school district boards of education to conduct meetings by teleconference or video conference, providing meetings also can be observed by the general public. In order to comply with this requirement, tonight's meeting is being broadcast live via Zoom and also on the district's YouTube channel. While operating under this blended environment and in the spirit of maintaining public participation, the board has accepted written comments in addition to those wishing to speak during the meeting on non-agenda items. Those wishing to address the board regarding non-agenda items must have submitted the required information to speak at the meeting or written comments to be read at the meeting prior to noon today. As of noon today, no one signed up to address the board regarding non-agenda items. Those wishing to address the board on agenda items may submit their name, topic of their comments, email address, and the telephone number from which they may be calling in the chat area of this Zoom meeting between now and 7 p.m. To ensure that all voices can be heard, please use the following guidelines. Only three people may speak or submit written comments on the same topic. Each speaker may take up to five minutes to address the board and each speaker may not reflect adversely on individuals. While public participation will not be interactive during tonight's meeting, follow up with individuals submitting public comments will occur at a later time. All comments are considered public record and are therefore subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. If I had a pencil, I would throw that. <laughs> it's 7 o'clock. We haven't been watching Daniel Boone episodes. Maybe with the X. Oh, there you go. We should do X throwing sometime. I'm not sure. I've never done it, but it looks fun. I've done it once. That's fun. Really?
again. Take that off speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for attending tonight's Board of Education meeting. Having received confirmation that the video is streaming correctly, Board of Education President, Mr. Robert Raglan will now call the meeting to order. Thank you for attending tonight's blended meeting of the Southwestern City School District Board of Education, dated September 14th, 2020. While the agenda will be visible during the meeting for those watching online, you may also follow along using the agenda posted on our website at www.swcsd.us under the Board of Education tab. Please remember that public participation will not be interactive during tonight's meeting. And please note that tonight's meeting may not run perfectly, we are, but we are doing the best to keep things running as smoothly as we continue down the path of virtual school board meetings. With that being said, I'd like to call a meeting to order. Roll call. Mr. Caldwell. Here. John Frio. Here. Ms. Johnson. Here. Mr. Schreiner. Here. Mr. Raglan. Here. Next up, the adoption of the agenda. So I have a motion. So moved, Mr. President Schreiner. Second, John Frio. Mr. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. And next up, approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? Moved by Johnson. Second by Anthony Caldwell. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. And next up, we have a presentation, opening of schools by Mr. David Stewart. Thank you, President Raglan, uh, Dr. Wise, Mr. Garside, members of the board. Um, it's great to see you this evening. Um, as Meredith pulls that up, I, I will start by saying that um, I've given this report now, this will be the eighth time I've given it. In the previous seven, I've pretty much taken the, the uh, same PowerPoint from the year before, plugged in the, the new information for that year and, and given the, the report. Uh, this year, that just didn't seem to, uh, to work uh, as, as this is such a unique year. So uh, what I've tried to do is pull out some highlights of um, the opening of school. Uh, to share with you, but certainly um, if there's anything I miss or any questions you have, I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, in general, let me just say that for all the obstacles in front of us um, and all of the unknown that um, we were dealing with as an organization, um, our, our return to school has been incredibly smooth. Um, and I credit um, uh, our teachers, um, our support staff, our principals, uh, and certainly our students and families uh, for everybody coming together 
uh, in a really trying time and, and making the best of a, of a challenging situation. And we've been really proud uh, and excited about, about how things have gone. So uh, for starters, just to, to review, I know you know a lot of this, but on August 27th, we, we came back to school on a fully remote um, environment. We talked before, but I just want to remind you uh, of some real differences that we had uh, between what remote instruction looked like in the spring of 2020 uh, and what we're calling remote learning 2.0 here in the fall uh, of 2020. And, and really there were about four um, key components to those differences. One was um, using Google Classroom, asking every teacher uh, to use Google Classroom as, uh, as a hub uh, not only for their instruction, uh, but for their communication with parents. And so uh, parents that have multiple children with multiple teachers in multiple buildings uh, now all know that they can go to one place to at least get a start to, to understand what it is they need to do uh, in order to support their students as they navigate school. Um, also, uh, we talked about a, a daily um, expectation for live interaction with each teacher. Um, and each building created its own building schedule and remote so that, that students um, who um, had the ability um, and the desire to have some predictability and a schedule in their day could, could follow that schedule if they're able uh, and have that daily live interaction with their teachers and the predictability of the schedule that was created. Uh, we also talked about uh, weekly parent interaction on, and opportunities for that. And then we also talked about um, that while some of our students really crave and need and desired that, um, like I said, that, that predictability and that accountability of a schedule, also many of our families and our students are not able, um, based on their situations when we're in a fully remote environment, to, to operate on a typical school day schedule. And so uh, we built in components of um, both synchronous and asynchronous learning that included uh, pre-recorded instruction for teachers um, so that students that couldn't follow that schedule still had the opportunity to access learning. Uh, what I will tell you is all four of those things happened and, and we were quite successful with it. Um, and I can tell you that we're very comfortable that should we need to at some point uh, revert to a remote learning environment, that, that uh, transition should be very seamless and we're ready to go with it. Um, so moving on then to um, the transition we made on September 8th to blended learning. Uh, there's really three, um, three distinct components of, of what goes on in blended learning. Um, again, all of our students are divided into a blue group or a green group. Uh, typically on most work weeks, uh, the blue group attends school on Monday and Tuesday. And on most weeks, the green group attends school on Thursday and Friday. Uh, I do want to point out that one of our, our very own uh, programmers, uh, Robert Kramer, uh, wrote a tool within Infinite Campus uh, that basically divided our entire district along the lines of common households uh, into a blue group and green group and almost in an exact 50 to 50 uh, ratio in just about every classroom in the district. Um, so we're really proud and grateful uh, of all the work that our technology team put in uh, to, to getting us to that point. But the face-to-face -face component looks like school, um, just with fewer kids. So um, the, the focus of the teacher primarily on those days are the, the students in front of them uh, and the experience that student have, students have in the classroom um, with some notable um, changes around safety uh, is, is fairly uh, similar to what we would anticipate a regular school year looking like. Uh, also in blended, uh, we talked that on most weeks, blue meets on Monday and Tuesday, green meets on, on Thursday and Friday. And that's because on Wednesdays, everybody is at home uh, for fully remote instruction. So Wednesdays um, during blended, um, when students are home on re remote instructions, those look uh, almost identical to what every day looked like during remote. We're utilizing those schedules that were created, um, the synchronous and the asynchronous learning, uh, the opportunities for live interaction with their teachers on those days. And while all that is going on, um, our support staff is, is doing a deep clean of our building to make sure that as we transition in a new group of students, uh, that the building has been fully cleaned and disinfected prior to a new group of students coming in. And then the third component during blended learning um, is that um, during uh, the opposite, so if you're a, a blue, um, you're in school on Monday and Tuesday. So on Thursday and Friday, 
Um, you, you are still learning. Teachers um, are still providing learning activities for you. Uh, but since those teachers are focusing on the, the, the other half of your class that's in front of them at that time, uh, a lot of that learning is a little more self-directed during those days. And that's when the use, the use of Google Classroom um, has really come in, into play. Um, I'm sure you're curious about uh, where we're seeing successes. And I, and I would point to two things. Um, one is the planning that went into all of this. Dr. Wise was very consistent um, in his messaging throughout the summer, especially into late July and August, uh, that as a district and as an organization, we need to be prepared to shift quickly uh, from one model to the next. Um, and even though we knew we were starting in remote, um, he, was, he was very adamant with, with our principals and with our uh, SSCs that we needed to be ready to switch um, when and if uh, that opportunity pre presented itself. And frankly, it did present itself a little sooner than we anticipated. Uh, and fortunately, our principals, um, uh, our, our SSCs, and, and the, the folks at the DSC that support all that work uh, took all of that messaging to heart and um, planned and overplanned and planned again. Um, and while there's always a lot of angst and fear of the unknown anytime you go into something you've never done before, uh, what we've seen is a real absence of any major uh, misses on our part uh, that we just hadn't accounted for. And so I, I would count that as, as uh, really a huge success uh, within the organization. And the other thing I would point to is, is simply the cooperation uh, and collaboration that we've had with our students, our families, uh, and our teachers. Um, you know, things that we didn't know how well it would go around uh, daily symptom assessments, wearing masks, um, social distancing. Uh, we've had almost uh, unanimous uh, cooperation from students and, and parents uh, with, those, uh, with those items. And it's really made that transition to blended uh, go all the more smoother. So I would really point to those two things um, as successes so far uh, early on in the year. Um, Meredith, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. As you also know, um, we have created a virtual learning academy for students who uh, chose a, a fully remote option for the entire 2020-21 uh, school year. So just to give you an update on that, uh, it's up and running and it's gone very well. Heidi Stevenson has taken on uh, the role of being the administrator of the virtual learning academy and she's done a fantastic job. Um, getting uh, 2,600 students and 171 staff members uh, all rowing in the same direction and having a lot of success. Uh, what we're hearing from students is and families in terms of what they like so far is uh, they like the flexibility of um, when and how they may access their learning. Uh, much like the conversation we had a little bit ago, the uh, not every family is situated the same way and in a remote situation and the flexibility to access uh, the content and the learning when it makes most sense for their family has been very well received. Um, and then the other thing that we're hearing from students and families um, is uh, that they appreciate the opportunity um, to go beyond the learning and to, uh, we have a, a great number of students that have moved much quicker than the curriculum would normally uh, call for. Um, and they've, they've found things that they are passionate about and they're having the opportunity to extend their learning uh, on those things at a pace that works for them. So uh, a lot of great uh, feedback from families on, on, uh, on those things. Uh, in terms of teachers, uh, what they're sharing with us is that it's a new, new type of collaboration and they're enjoying um, using the new tools that we have, as well as um, 170 other colleagues that are all in the same new environment, new situation, and collaborating with them and students and families to, uh, to figure out how to reach students in new ways. Uh, they're enjoying the creativity that this not only asks for, but allows uh, them to use. Um, and they're, they're enjoying um, trying different ways of connecting with students uh, beyond just the traditional face-to-face -face, uh, classroom. So again, uh, we've had a lot of success. Um, you know, again, a, a completely new venture for the district, uh, but we're very pleased with how things have gone uh, in this short period of time. Uh, just a reminder, again, nothing new here that we haven't talked about before, but just a reminder that, um, you know, when we talk about all of the things that um, our, our principals and our SSCs had to prepare for, um, this list is just a snapshot of, of what they had to be ready for, because there was no way to standardize any one of these things 
um, at, at every building because every building is um, different, both from um, both from um, the standpoint of the physical layout uh, of the building um, or uh, the, the makeup of the students, the makeup of the staff. Um, I believe, Mr. Caldwell, you asked me to define SSC, and thank you for the question. I probably, um, SSC is our, our site steering committees. Um, th those are uh, representative of the teaching staff that work in collaboration with the administrative team uh, to make decisions about, about the building. So uh, that's what SSC stands for. Uh, but again, along the lines of these safety protocols, um, we have daily cleaning uh, procedures um, that um, any of these items that are underlined are available. Those are links. And if anybody wants to use the PowerPoint that's available online, uh, you can see some of these things online if you want to take a look at them. But uh, we have daily cleaning procedures, uh, which differ from what goes on then on those Wednesday deep cleaning days uh, that are really focused on uh, a deep disinfecting of, of each building. Uh, each building has um, created both arrival and dismissal procedures. Uh, that really emphasize social distancing um, and uh, making sure that students are coming into the building, going directly to classrooms or getting food uh, in a way that keeps them away from other people, allows for masks uh, and things like that. Uh, buildings have had to completely alter their breakfast and lunch uh, procedures, again, to emphasize social distancing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. Uh, you may remember that um, all of our buildings actually have two clinics, health clinics this year. Uh, one we would call a well clinic and one would be a, a sick clinic. So we are keeping students uh, who may be showing symptoms um, of, of any number of illnesses, but certainly uh, COVID-19, separate from students who just need to access the clinic for uh, a Band-Aid or for me medication or uh, any other of your kind of typical things. So every one of our buildings has two clinics this year um, and well students are being uh, kept uh, separate from students who may be ill. Um, we are doing daily symptom assessments um, every day. Um, every student starts their day um, answering four different questions. Uh, one of the questions includes, um, did you take your temperature this morning? Uh, and if students did not, um, they, we do take their temperature and, and make sure that um, they are b b beneath that 100.4 uh, 100 uh, degree standard. Every classroom is, um, has uh, both disinfectant and hand sanitizer that teachers and students can use uh, as they see fit. Uh, we've created uh, procedures and protocols for music, art, physical education. Uh, we've purchased um, supplies, for example, in music, um, different shields that, uh, that keeps um, some of the, the spit and things like that that might fly around uh, during band or choir, um, keeps those in check. Uh, uh, we've, we've purchased uh, supply kits specific to each student so that maybe in an art class they're not sharing um, supplies. And so we've created uh, protocols for each one of those areas. I'll talk about buses in a little bit. Um, and each building has created um, procedures for one-way hallways, um, how and when to access the restroom, to make sure that we don't have uh, too many students in any one area at any time. The bottom line is what our buildings are doing is they're creating a culture of uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and just good hygiene habits. And again, we're, we're very pleased with the cooperation that we've had from students and families um, on these items. Uh, you may have seen in the news that the governor um, issued an order that um, really binds both um, schools and parents to, to share information about positive uh, COVID-19 tests. And so um, essentially what we, we've done is we've sent uh, information home to parents that simply says, um, if you have a positive case in your household, we ask that you call our attendance line and share that information uh, with us. Um, we, we track that information um, and we've tried to make it as simple as we can. Our nurses are the big heroes in this. Uh, they gather that information, uh, they enter it into a Google form, uh, they communicate with the parent um, based on our protocols for uh, when children can return to school uh, and make sure each family understands how that those protocols um, impact their family. Uh, they enter all of that information into a Google form that comes over to us and we monitor that every day. Um, and uh, when we do have a positive case, then we work with the principal to make sure that the appropriate notification uh, goes both to families um, and to the Franklin County uh, Public Health Department. 
Um, there is a difference between um, someone having a positive test um, and someone coming into close contact with somebody with a positive test. So um, we, the letter goes home in the event of a positive test. Uh, we do a lot more contact tracing when that happens. Uh, when it's simply a close contact uh, with someone with a positive test, uh, we have uh, protocols for um, quarantining that individual for a certain number of days to make sure that everybody around them is safe. Uh, we have those notifications letters that go home uh, in English, Spanish, and Somali. Uh, I mentioned that in the case of a positive test, our, our nurses and our principals uh, assist in doing contact tracing, and we share all of that information with Franklin County Public Health and with obviously families of any student that is impacted. Um, I spoke a little bit about our, our uh, return to school protocols, and so the last thing uh, I'll mention with regards to COVID-19 reporting is that um, Part of the order is that we have a dashboard um, that communicates to our parents um, everything that I just discussed, the number of uh, close contact cases, uh, as well as the number of positive tests, uh, both for students and for staff. And so uh, we do have that dashboard up and running. It will be updated every Friday. Um, and you can find that on the web, uh, back to school website on the district website. A uh, couple things with uh, some of our uh, other departments, um, food service, some exciting news. Um, we, the, the federal government extended the seamless summer program through December 31st. Uh, and so what that means is essentially all of the meals that we distribute to students uh, currently uh, are free of charge to the student. Uh, and the other really nice thing is that if we go back to a, a fully remote environment, uh, we will be able to feed students every day, uh, both um, from some of our kitchens and from some remote, remote locations, again, free of charge, uh, much like we did in the spring of uh, 2020. Um, we currently in the blended environment, uh, we are sending meals home uh, with students two times a week. Once they, one time, uh, they receive two days worth of meals and the other day they receive three. Um, students who are in the VLA can also come to school uh, and we give them a full week's worth of meals uh, every Monday. Um, the only thing we ask for students who want to take these meals home uh, is that they utilize our online ordering system so that we know how much food to make. Uh, along the, the lines of uh, safety, uh, we've talked about this before, but we're no longer having multiple kids touch a, a pin uh, code, uh, pad, uh, we are scanning barcodes and at the high schools, um, students can actually download our infinite campus app and their, their barcode comes up right up on the app and we can scan it right off of their phone, uh, which makes it, uh, much quicker, uh, and obviously much safer. Uh, we are updating the web, uh, the website, uh, daily or excuse me, weekly. Uh, and I think it's important to note that with all of this um, feeding of students that we're doing, sometimes at school, sometimes we're sending meals home, all of the, the nutri nutrition requirements that we've always had uh, still are in place and we still meet those uh, with every meal. Uh, moving on to transportation, just some updates there. We are running 183 bus routes uh, this year. Uh, we, we have um, even in blended, we have um, scheduled those routes as if we were in uh, an environment where everybody was attending five days a week. I share that with you to say, uh, we've talked a lot about the potential of moving back to remote, but we're also equally prepared uh, to move to a five day a week uh, environment if that's the direction that things head. And in transportation, that would be a seamless, um, seamless transition because that's how we're currently routed. Uh, we did make some purchases of new buses, um, six transit buses, four conventional buses, uh, two wheelchair buses, and new to the district are three micro buses. Uh, those are similar to what you might see at an airport, shuttling uh, passengers back and forth from a parking lot. What that allows us to do is to get into some areas that's very difficult to get into uh, with our larger buses. So we're excited about that. Again, much like every other part of our district, um, safety has been a huge uh, component of um, the opening of school with regards to transportation. Uh, we are cleaning our buses, um, not only um, every night, uh, but drivers are cleaning and sanitizing buses between every run. So every time students uh, are dropped off at a location and the bus is empty before our drivers pick up another load of students, they are disinfecting the entire bus. 
Uh, we have protocols for unloading and, and loading so that students are, are crossing paths. We, uh, we load from back to front and we unload from front to back. Um, students have assigned seats and where we can, we're staggering our arrival time so that not all of our students are getting off of buses at the same time and crowding an entryway or crowding a cafeteria that hopefully we're able to get those into the building um, over a short or over a little bit longer period of time. Um, and finally, technology, uh, just some stats. We've uh, deployed 5,500 new student Chromebooks uh, this summer across the district. Uh, we've updated about 560 um, teacher devices from our phase one and phase two elementary buildings. Um, and um, probably in December, we will update the remainder of those teacher devices uh, across all of our phase two and phase three buildings. Uh, we updated 134 teacher stations at Grove City, Westland, uh, and East, East Franklin uh, with a 75 uh, inch interactive panel, uh, which replaced the old projector um, and teacher PC that we had uh, in those, those buildings initially. Uh, we upgraded 1,000 PCs at all grade levels to Windows 10. Uh, we replaced the Identikit computers um, uh, with a touchscreen for e easier public use in all of our buildings. Uh, but really, the, the question that I get, get asked the most is um, how many hotspots and how many Chromebooks do we have in the hands of students uh, currently? And so currently, we have about um, 600 uh, hotspots in homes that we have activated uh, to help with internet access. And we have um, about 20,000 uh, district owned um, Chromebooks in the hands of students every day right now. Um, and just a reminder um, for parents, we have a couple of options uh, if, they, if they have um, technology needs. Uh, if they have any hardware needs, things just aren't working, uh, we encourage them to email Chromebook help at swcsd.us. And then if they're having software issues, whether it's Google Classroom or Infinite Campus, uh, the best place to go is ichelp at swcsd.us. Uh, but the reality is if, if a parent uh, emails either of those addresses, we'll be able to uh, take care of whatever their issue happens to be. So that's the, uh, the meat of my presentation. Um, again, I just can't say how excited we are uh, about uh, how well our students and our staff have, uh, have really uh, taken on this new challenge. Um, and we're, we're excited about what the future holds. Very much, any questions? Mr. President. Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a comment, if I may, just to take the opportunity, um, it goes without saying how much planning goes into this, the adaptability uh, the communication, just uh, excellent. Please pass that on to our staff members, to our administration, uh, our, our teachers, just phenomenal. Um, the adaptability part of it especially, but with, with the planning that goes into it in these unprecedented times, um, very impressive start, thank you. Thank you. And on a personal note, I really feel old. You mentioned SSC site steering. I was the parent rep from 1996 to 2007 at all the schools. And I was glad to see that they were collaborating within that. So. Yeah, they've done a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Next up, board reports. And next up, public participation relative to agenda items. Done. And the next legislation liaison report, Mr. Lee Schreiner. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, this evening uh, under board le legislative report, I'm gonna synthesize uh, a, a few items. A COVID-19 immunity bill uh, sent to the governor, the Ohio House of Representatives and the Senate through a conference committee, ironed out differences between the chambers on House Bill 606, a bill that provides K through 12 schools and others immunity from civil liability due to the exposure of COVID-19. The legislation that passed the House at the end of May was amended in the Senate before passage in June. The House on September 1st reconvened and voted not to concur with the Senate amendments to, the, to its bill. 
and a conference committee was subsequently convened. Members of the committee were able to uh, expeditiously work and favorably approve a bill that both chambers could support. Two changes to the bill were made during the conference committee. The first change moved the expiration date of the liability protections from December 31st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. And the second change removed the bill's emergency clause. The House accepted the conference committee report on House Bill 606 by a vote of 62 to 30, and the Senate, Senate followed suit by a vote of 22 to eight. Uh, the governor, signed that bill in into law today. Um, Ohio Department of Health uh, order allows all sports to continue. The governor uh, announced that all contact and non-contact sports may continue through uh, an Ohio Department of Health ODH order that provides mandatory practice, competition, and spectator requirements. The order applies to youth, collegiate, amateur, club, and professional sports. The ODH order requires daily symptom assessments, maintaining at least six feet social distancing from individuals and strict compliance with the fa face mask order. The face mask requirements allow exceptions for players who are on the field or court of play and for coaches and officials during games and practices among a, a few other exceptions. Additionally, schools are allowed to move fall sports to the spring. Uh, Ohio Department of Education. The, the Ohio Department of Education announced the 2020 Ohio school report cards are expected to be released on September 15th. That's tomorrow. The report cards will not have grades or ratings due to provisions in House Bill 197. Additionally, ODE announced deadline flexibility for educator licensure renewal as well. And as far as the United States Department of Education is concerned, uh, the United States Department of Education announced that the interim final rule regarding the use of CARES Act K-12 emergency relief funds for non-public equitable services is no longer in effect. The rule was struck down by U.S. District Judge Dabney Frederick, and she indicated that her, her summary judgment that it would be applied nationwide. Uh, Mr. President, that uh, concludes my legislative report. And thank you, Mr. Schreiner. Uh, next up, Student and Staff Achievement, Mr. Anthony Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. President. I think uh, Mr. Stewart's uh, report actually covered uh, the greatest achievement by our students and our staff. I mean, it's just really incredible uh, the resiliency that they've had through this whole process. Um, and so we will save those uh, individual um, celebrations for our next meeting. Thank you. And fiscal and operation, back to Mr. Lee Schreiner. Thank you again, Mr. President. Uh, this evening, we have nine action items on tonight's agenda under fiscal and operational management. The first, revised permanent appropriations for fiscal year 2020-2021, exhibit X1. It's recommended that the Board of Education approve the revised permanent appropriations. Secondly, uh, investments and financial statements for August 2020, Exhibit X2 and X3. It's recommended that in accordance with Section 135.14 of the Ohio Revised Code, the Board of Education approve August investments, Exhibit X2, and the cash position report for the month of August 2020, Exhibit X3 as submitted. Total investments, 397 million seven hundred ninety six thousand five hundred and thirty seven dollars and seventy five cents interest earnings month to date two hundred eighty six thousand nine hundred and thirty eight dollars and ninety five cents interest earnings year to date seven hundred and thirty eight thousand three hundred and fifteen dollars and nine cents interest rates zero point zero one four to two point nine five zero percent third Payment of bills, exhibit X4. It's recommended that the Board of Education approve payment of bills according to the list of checks for the month of August 2020. Four donations, exhibit X5. Total donations this month of $185. As always, a, a thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts to contributors. Fifth, authorization to pay bills in accordance with section 5705.41. 
Ohio Revised Code, it is recommended that the Board of Education authorize the treasurer to pay bills for August, which were not processed in accordance with section 5705.41 Ohio, Ohio Revised Code, Exhibit X6. Six. Sixth, agreement with Reading Writing Project Network, LLC. It's recommended that the Board of Education enter into an agreement with the Reading Writing Project Network LLC to provide professional development services to the district for the 2020-21 school year as presented in X7. <laughs> professional development provided is a continuation of the teacher's college focusing on literacy and English language arts. Seventh, agreement with the Directions for Youth. It's recommended that the Board of Education enter into an agreement with the Directions for Youth and Families to provide assessments and individual service plans for students in the amount of $60,000 for the 2020-21 school year, Exhibit X8. Eighth, agreement with the Buckeye Ranch, Inc. It is recommended that the Board of Education enter into an agreement with the Buckeye Ranch, Inc to provide the services of a licensed mental health therapist to serve at Finland Middle School the 2020-2021 school year, Exhibit X9. And finally, ninth, membership in the Ohio Coalition of Equity and Adequacy of School Funding Voucher Project Litigation. It's recommended that the Board of Education become partners with the Ohio Coalition for Equity and Adequacy of School Funding Voucher Project Litigation for the 2020-21 school year. And after reviewing all of these action items, Mr. President, I move them for passage. Second. Second, Father Friel. Thank you. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. And next up, policy, Vice President Kathy Johnson. Thank you, President Raglan. Today we have the second and final reading of policy 3220, the standards-based teacher education. Uh, it's printed in the attachment here within the agenda. Uh, we talked about it last month, actually, yes. And having reviewed it, I move it for passage. Second, Anthony Caldwell. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Ragland. Yes. And next up, curriculum, Mr. Anthony Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight we have one item on our agenda under curriculum. Uh, it's recommended that the Southwestern City School District Board of Education approve uh, the attached uh, K through 12 reduced fee schedule for 2021. Uh, we recognize the challenges that these times are having on families and, and wanted to reduce those fees. Um, and also the due date for those fees has, has been pushed back slightly uh, to allow for the consideration of, of tonight's recommended fee reduction. Um, having reviewed this item, I make a motion that we pass it. Is there a second? Second. Before you vote on that item, also know that anybody who has paid already can either receive a refund or have that credit applied to the future. So it's not so sorry type of thing. We'll make sure that they get credit appropriately. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Second, Schreiner. David already. Oh, good. Sorry. Roll we'll call Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. And the next up, personnel, Vice President Kathy Johnson. Thank you, President Raglan. On the board agenda this evening are eight personnel items involving 109 persons. They include 10 certificated and administrative resignations, one administrative employment, six certificated changes in employment status, 46 certificated employments, 13 classified resignations, 13 classified changes in employment status, 19 classified employments, and regretfully one message of condolence for Janie Wenlinger, 
Uh, I'd like to add that Janie was employed as a secretary to Grove City High School on August 21st, 2017 in recognition and appreciation of her service to the students in our district. A motion is in order by the Board of Education expressing deepest sympathy to the family and friends of Ms. Wemlinger who passed away on September 10th, 2020. Having reviewed these items, I move them for passage. I'll second that, Mr. President Schreiner. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. And we had no public participation for non-agenda items. Next up, we need a motion for adjournment. I'll move we adjourn. Second, Anthony Caldwell. All right, roll call. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Donofrio. Yes. Mr. Schreiner. Yes. Mr. Raglan. Yes. Thank you very much. Stay safe, wash your hands, and wear your mask. Huh. Bye.